Hello and welcome to Citizens Forum. It's March 27th. We're filming in the beautiful Memorial Arena in, uh, in Victoria, downtown. I'd like to thank our volunteer crew and Shaw staff who make it all possible. The first part of uh, Citizens Forum is always the Walter and Jack show and uh, we just talk about what we think the issues are. I'm going to start with cars. Uh, there was a story in the paper today, March 27th or maybe yesterday, there was a leak, a leak at the tar sands. I mean, this tremendously poisonous goop that they've saved up for years and everybody knew, you know, it's just a matter of time. Now it's, it's, it's leaking out, it leaks out all the time, I'm sure. And uh, so they're trying to contain it. It's a story, you know, it makes the... But the problem is there is, I think, a direct link between our cars that we drive and the tar sands and, and the computers that we use electricity for and everything we do. And the question is, we know we're destroying the planet. Can we start to cut back? I mean, cars is one thing. Everything else, too. I mean, everything. Can we do it? Are we willing and able to do it? Can we create the society and the leadership that can help us do it? And we'll probably end up, I think we'll end up with better lives and better communities and a better world. But can we do it? Well, I think we can do it, Jack. You know, everything is done in small steps, you know, and designing communities, uh, you know, you can design communities that don't rely on automobiles. You know, you don't have to have uptown malls and uh, large large strip malls and you can have smaller shopping centers you can ha you design public transport systems and everything like that it's it's easily done uh, but what is stopping us I think is that we don't have uh, the right people in the right jobs and the right positions in, in government that will bring forward this stuff I think we have a situation where we just have a lot of people with special interests that are running the show and it's not their interests are not in our best interests. And I guess that gets right down to a very fundamental issue which is that who runs this country? Is it us Canadians? Has anybody ever asked us what we'd like our cities to be like and then gone ahead and done that? You know I don't think that's ever happened. Um, the corporations, you know, General Motors, uh, you know, going back 40 years, the oil companies, the car companies, the development companies that own the malls. I really think our cities are set up because that's the way our cities work best for them. So we're driving the most cars and burning the most oil and living maybe the craziest lifestyle, um, separated a lot from each other. We don't really have neighborhoods and communities that much anymore, although we, we do. People make them, but they're not, they're not designed that way so much. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you took a shot from space down at the planet, you'd see all these roads and driveways and buildings, and the dominant species from a distance looks like it would be the automobile. And then this other unit that seems to get in and out of them and d seems to be servicing the automobile. We we're just seem to be the slaves to the automobile. From a distance, that's what it looks like. And we're dedicating so much real estate to the automobile and so many resources. And, and destroying the planet for the At automobile. At the same time. So can we, can we all cut down a little bit? Can we? Well, we'll see. Well, it's been done in many, many communities, especially in Europe and in, in Japan. You'll see lots of places where there's a lot less dependency on. Yeah. Well, I guess what we can do is start calling up our governments, our politicians and our media and saying, find out what we want. Maybe we want some change and then do it. Um, I won't get into the Blue Bridge, which is something that our Victoria City Council just did, which is the exact opposite of everything we've just been talking about. Um, you know, but I mean, basically, they here we had a rail link, a possible rail link to solve our biggest transportation problem, which is the Callwood Crawl. We have a rail line that runs from Langford right into downtown, and we're, we've never used it as as a commuter rail because the people who run the world that's not what they want. Well, and now you know, Victoria it, it, City Council, but, but now Victoria City Council has actually removed the rail bridge, so it can't happen. 
What kind of craziness is this? Well, it's in the interest of, of some people to remove the rail bridge. You know, and, and you look at all these different issues and it almost seems like a large public infrastructure project is, is for sure will go ahead if there's a major flaw with it. You know, if there's no major flaw, they'll find a reason why not to do it. There was a, this is the Vancouver province from uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think. Um, and the, the, this is the Vancouver province a couple of weeks ago. The story on the front page is called, and I can't remember, so I have to look, Generation Lost. And the subhead says, Today's 20-somethings are struggling to find jobs and start their adult lives. So yeah, young people are having a tough time. And the point I want to make is that, you know, young people, if, if you have, uh, if you are a young person trying to start out, if, you know, your family, your friends, in my opinion, this is the plan. I mean, our society has been devised and designed over the past 20 years so that there won't be a good future for you. I mean, all we used to have a middle class that everybody could be in and have a fairly comfortable life. Well, the corporations and their politicians have gotten rid of that. And now we've got this up here and more and more people are down here. I mean, that's, what's, that's just the fact. And I just want to say to young people, it's not by accident. This is the design. And if you don't, I mean, I don't know what people know, but, you know, you've got to fight back. We all have to fight back against it. Well, I mean, the kids have to get engaged. And, I'm, you know, this is a serious concern of mine. Is, you know, I have two uh, young adults, uh, kids of mine that, you know, are struggling, like all these other kids are to really find their way. And... Uh, they're not engaged politically either. And uh, I look at them and think, you know, if you guys want to shape your future, you have to get in there and start becoming active and start demanding things, demanding change. But they're doing it in Quebec. They're doing it in Quebec. And, and, and they're having success there. And look what's happening. Look at the reaction from the corporate government. Yeah. The arrest of... Hun and I mean, if there is violence, you know, the the police are not, you know, I mean, there's problems with the police, but the police are not the enemy. If, if people are throwing stones, breaking windows, okay, that's one thing. But I think it's more the arresting of peaceful and legitimate protesters in Quebec that is, and in Toronto a few years ago at the G20. I mean, this, if we allow that to happen, then we're truly finished as, yeah. as a democracy. No, I, and it takes a lot of courage. You know, I think the imagery you see on on these sort of uh, public demonstrations of you know the cops uh, wading in and bopping people over the head and dragging people around that's pretty frightening imagery for young people to look at. It's not enticing. It's not something that they feel like. Gee, I want to get involved in that. If, if you're even even if you have a lot of concerns, and I, I think. Um, there's a lot of thought of issues that we should be thinking about around public participation and citizens' actions and legitimacy of citizens' actions and protests. Uh, the thing that makes a democracy strong is the tolerance for protest. And what makes a democracy strong is to actually have some democracy. We shouldn't <laughs> have to be protesting. When you think about it, why should we be protesting against our government? Especially when the majority of us want something to happen. Yeah, I mean, the, the, let's face it, I mean, you and I agree on this, that... There is no democracy. We've spent, a, we've spent our lifetime struggling against our governments. It seems kind of strange that you think once in a while they do something right. Uh, maybe they do, and I haven't noticed I'm it. sure they do. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to compliment the Victoria City government on what they are doing in Beacon Hill Park, because a few of the roads have been closed, um, and parts of the parker are kind of more empty of cars now. And it is great. It's yeah. wonderful. I really want to thank whoever at uh, Victoria City Hall did that. Thank you so much. And people who are watching, look in the phone book. Or does anybody have a phone book anymore? But get in touch with Victoria City Hall and let them know if you support it. And let them know if you don't support it. 
because I think they need the support to keep those changes happening. And we've got 10 minutes left. <laughs> so did you want to talk a little bit about, uh, I see you have the, the no, story. No, one more thing first. Okay. okay. Um, the HST. Oh, okay. do you want I to just, talk about the I, HST? I think the HST is ending as of next week, right. April 1st. Uh, this is March 27th now. There was, uh, there's been some big stories, a lot of coverage about the HST. But the one thing that, to my mind, the media never mentions is the real reason why we got the HST in the first place, and that's because it's a tax shift. So what happened when the HST was brought in is that we people, we citizens, began to pay about $2 billion a year more in taxes, and business, and especially the big businesses, paid $2 billion a year less. The government basically didn't get any more money, although they may have gotten a little bit. But really, a $2 billion per year tax was put on us, and a lot of people never knew this part of it because it was never mentioned, and a lot of people still don't know. And it was a year and a half ago in September that people voted to get rid of the HST. It took them a year and a half to do it. They said, oh, it's so difficult. It's not difficult. It took them a year and a half to get rid of it. That year and a half cost us citizens $3 billion in taxes. And for the business community, it was $3 billion saved. And nobody ever mentioned it. Not the media, not the government, not the NDP, nobody. Yeah, you know, you can almost guarantee it. I remember back when they are starting to bring in the HST and, and I was having a discussion with somebody and, and they said, well, what's going to happen? And I said, I, not, I don't know for sure, but I'll, I can pretty well guarantee that poor people will pay more and rich people will pay less. That's usually how taxes go. And that's no matter of, how you yeah. spin it around, the working poor and the poor tend to, to take the brunt of the, uh, of the new tax. And that's because most of us no longer have any say in our governments. The governments are run by the one percent or the or even the one percent of the one percent and the rest of us are out of the loop what's uh, there was something you wanted to talk about well Let's we could talk a little bit about uh, the Wi-Fi in school issues wireless internet connections in schools Wi-Fi in schools you know, and uh, of course school district 61 still in the midst of trying to make a decision whether or not they're going to uh, roll out Wi-Fi in all the elementary schools and in, uh, in Victoria. Okay, but your opposition is because you believe that it's unsafe for the well, children. Well, Wi-Fi, it, 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 it's, a, it's a form of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, they use uh, wireless technology to transmit information. And uh, in a classroom setting, this can be a very high exposure level, sometimes hundreds of times higher than your little Wi-Fi router at home. Because most people don't understand that when you, in order to have a classroom, and you have several classrooms of not dozens in a school, all wanting to fire up computers. All the laptops are, are transmitters and receivers also. And uh, when you get in a classroom and the teacher says, okay, let's download something, everybody, everybody fires up the computers and tries to download, you know, you can get tremendous field strength within the classroom of just trying to get this data downloaded into the computers. This is an exposure level that's very, very dangerous for students. But, but the powers that be, well, they do care enough so that at least in some elementary schools in Victoria School District and I think Saanich, they're not in yet. Now the, uh, the, the uh, uh, teachers union in British Columbia just had an annual general meeting in Vancouver and they passed a resolution asking uh, that's going to protect the teachers from overexposure to Wi-Fi type radiation. So we there is well, a, I wouldn't agree that it's going to really do that. Well, they're asking for they're asking the school boards to do that. But aren't they saying that if somebody is electrosensitive, then it will be recognized as a as a yeah, condition. But I mean, we're all exposed to it. If we're less sensitive, it's something's happening to us. Just you know, not as acutely, we're all paying the price. It, it's all around us all the time, 24 hours a day, everywhere. Well, you, you made a good point. I mean, right now, even amongst the teachers, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, varying opinions on the hazard and how serious it is. 
And the smoking analogy is, I think, really works here. Back in the 60s, teachers sat in classrooms and smoked cigarettes. I remember. Okay. So and I, when I was in trade school, the, the, the guys in trade school sat in, in, in around me and smoked cigarettes also. So, I mean, it's just a matter of awareness. And uh, we have to bring this on, you know, carefully. We have a resolution that has been passed that recognizes this as a condition. And, and I think it's important that the teachers are starting to recognize this as a serious situation. Other jurisdictions like the LA Teachers Association and many others around the world have had much stronger resolutions and are much you know, more strident in protecting their health and the health of the students. And it's worth mentioning, which you've told me, that there's absolutely no need for Wi-Fi in schools because it would be, I think you said, even cheaper to just wire it all in. Yeah. You get, uh, you get better ability to download, you emit, you eliminate the health risk, not a risk, it's the health certainty, yeah. the problem, et cetera, so why not do it? But Well, you could have laptop computers that are not downloading information all the time. You can plug them in and download the course in a few minutes, and you could uh, just have it on the laptop and they could use it that way. Smart boards are wired in. You do not need wireless in order to have this sort of called so-called advanced technology in the classroom. It's just a matter of using it carefully. Now, the International Agency for Research on Cancer did declare this type of radiation as carcinogenic. Our health officer just doesn't seem to be able to get that. He, he's more uh, interested in forcing uh, healthcare workers to, to get vaccinated. Uh, be vaccinated and then, uh, then actually addressing a real no, health and, and concern. And once again, it just goes down to this crazy it's it's like if you look at who's running the country is it us citizens do we have any say anywhere it's well in this case limited. i think we're putting a fair amount of pressure on the school boards and there's some serious issues about uh how the technology is being brought in uh, the ministry of education is pushing the technology the electrical slash you know computer industry is is, is yeah, but why should we have to be fighting our school boards? I mean, there is no question that the technology is dangerous. I mean, everybody should know that. Then we should say, all of us, well, we know it's dangerous, kind of like smoking. We yeah. don't allow smoking in schools or anywhere inside anymore, but we do allow this, and we allow it to get ramped up in schools to really, really high levels. Is this what we want to do? Well, if people say, yes, it is, then okay, then we do it. But the Parents Advisory Committee for the province of BC has asked that at least one school in every district, one high school, one elementary school, and one middle school, be kept Wi-Fi free for kids who want it and who are, who are paying a, a health price. The, the school boards won't do that. Some do, some don't. I mean, hello. Well, these school boards are elected, by the way, and uh, the the four councillors that are now new fresh councillors or fresh trustees are uh, just been recently elected onto the school board all are against wi-fi uh, all the old hands as five, five others on the school board school at 661 are pro wi-fi but the thing is jack that the, the times they are changing and uh after the next election if this this these um the old hands in the school board if they don't change their opinions they're going to be gone they're the least popular on the school board in election and votes, and it's not going to be very hard at all for the citizens to, to, to wrap up a campaign to get rid of the rest of them. That's how it works, Jack. We can, we can make change. It takes a little bit of time. And I think, you know, uh, if they don't want to represent the interests of the teachers and the parents, uh, they're not going to be in those chairs after the next election, I guarantee you. We've got one minute left. Um, I want, uh, I think we should all be fighting for chairs, for cashiers to be able to sit on when they're at work because having to stand for long periods of time is a kind of torture. It's not nice. We shouldn't make cashiers do it. I don't know which level of government can regulate it, but they absolutely should, and it's a disgrace that the stores themselves don't. Um, and one more thing. Cooperation. There is a chance for the three federal political parties to work together um, and get rid of the, this 40% Harper government. Um, look into it. Thanks for watching the Walter and Jack segment of uh, Citizens Forum.